So, I'm Harvey from Player Research. Uh, we are an independent user research consultancy based in both Brighton and in Montreal. We've worked on over 200 games in the last few years, and we estimate our kind of reach to players to be in the region of around 2 billion. So, Player Research were commissioned by Google Play to develop a series of educational articles. Uh, the first of these, which is what I'm going to talk about today, um, was to outline a series of new UX principles for game development. And these aren't focused on tackling any one particular UX problem, but rather on the disconnect between the design and the vision that the developers have for the game. And these are meant to be used by any developer and even any user researcher, regardless of whether they currently engage in games user research or to what degree they engage in user research. Um, and the issues that the principles themselves are meant to tackle are present in pretty much all games, in the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and without focusing on these principles and without tackling them head on, then there's very little escape from a, from a poor user experience. And player research were keen to engage in this project for a number of reasons. Uh, the primary one, of course, is the reason that most of us are doing what we're doing, and that's helping building games that put players at the centre. But also to, to drive the discussion around games user research and the place it has in game development. And this article is publicly available on Medium, and this talk is going to augment that information in the article rather than just go over it. So the approach we took to developing the principles was two stage. The first of all, the first stage was to, to draw upon the wealth of existing principles and heuristics that are already out there. There's lots of fantastic sets, and we wanted to develop something that was that was different from them and to use have a different use. Um, and we we basically went through these heuristics and grouped them into into various themes individually. Uh, and a number began to emerge, a number of themes. Things like tutorial timing and structure, controls, language, and text. Um, and once we had these themes from the heuristics, we moved on to the games focus and games forward. We went through a load of player research articles from, from games that we've worked on in the past and reports um, from both expert analyses and from playtests, from games across a wide range of of genres and various stages in development, sometimes the same game in multiple stages of development. And again, we grouped the issues that we had in those reports from the past, we grouped them into, into themes once again and, and tried to map them onto the themes that we had seen coming through from the heuristics. Some of them fit very nicely, some of them didn't fit so nicely, so we had to kind of rethink the way we were grouping things. Um, we, had a, we had a big miscellaneous section that we expected to fill up pretty much immediately. Uh, however, that didn't, that didn't happen, which was heartening. There were only a few in there by the end, so everything sort of fit rather neatly. And I just want to highlight here that the, the principles that we were developing, uh, I'm just going to go back to slide, the principles that we, that we were developing, we were keen to develop something that was, that was more useful than just a checklist, uh, and more focused around helping developers make sure that their vision is being realised at every step of the process. So I'm going to talk very briefly, very briefly, don't worry, about the principles themselves. Uh, this, uh, this information is all in the article on Medium, that you can follow that handy link in the corner of each slide. Um, so I'm just going to go through each one very quickly. Uh, so, audience suitable complexity. Difficulty in games comes in a number of forms, and not just from the mechanics that have been designed and baked in. Uh, things like visual and oral processing, memory, literacy and numeracy, are all factors that need to be considered to make sure that the difficulty and the challenge from the game is coming from where the developer intends it to come from. And I'm going to repeat what I'm sure many people say in this field multiple times a day, I'm, I'm not here to make the games easier, I'm just here to make sure the difficulty is coming from where it's supposed to be. Designing for flexibility. So how do games fit into people's everyday lives? There's particularly mobile games where people are playing on the bus or while waiting for a taxi or whatever. And how does accessibility fit into the plans with the game development? And perhaps long periods away from the game, how, how can players relearn? How can they revisit the tutorial, maybe? Leveraging familiarity. So this is familiarity within the game itself, within the genre at large, or just from life. We need to ensure that things do what the players expect them to. It's a key factor in the learnability of features. So assistance nearby. Can players find this information that they need? 
new players often try and jump straight in without necessarily reading the tutorial or really understanding the game itself. <coughs> Feedback systems and error prevention safeguards need to be in place to ensure players don't get lost and make sure that they don't lose faith in the game. And as we all know, trying to teach players outright is difficult. A heavy-handed eight by numbers tutorial is often ineffective. Um, and you're likely to see a pretty strong tutorial completion rate if you do have this paint by numbers tutorial, but if players don't necessarily understand the game by the end of the tutorial, then was it necessarily that useful? And this is the point where, well, they're all the point where user research comes in, but certainly in this one, bringing real players in to help really pin down that Goldilocks tutorial, the one that's just right, it just provides enough information to be, to be useful, but not so much as to overwhelm. And finally, clarity of depth. You've taught players the basics, they get the game. But how well are you communicating what's next? How does the metagame fit in with the core gameplay? Often the metagame is the, the more complex side of things, the one that requires slightly more difficult mental models. Um, and there's often a disconnect between the core gameplay and the metagame. And it's this side of things that really begins to drive retention and monetization when the metagame is clearly communicated. So, using the principles. As I mentioned before, these principles are supposed to be immediately actionable and useful for development teams. Uh, checking that thought and time has been devoted to each of the areas that the principles focus on um, should help ensure a good player experience and the vision for that experience are, are married up. Another potential use is to, to help guide a research plan, mixing and matching methods throughout the development lifecycle to ensure that each aspect is fully ensure, explored should ensure a well-rounded user experience. And the principles in the article are accompanied by a set of questions. This is just a small selection of them. And these are questions for players, these are questions about players and for the team, for the development team. I pulled out a few examples here, um, and these are mainly to help to help guide the discussion and ensure that everything's being covered properly. Now, as I might have mentioned before, uh, these principles aren't supposed to be a set of commandments carved into stone in the corner of the office that you can't possibly break. These games need some of the limitations that breaking some of the principles bring. That's where the fun starts to creep in. It's breaking all of them, or a lot of them, when things start to get problematic. Intentionally breaking one or two is certainly not a bad thing. So the next step for this project, uh, and the next article that we wrote for Google that has been released yesterday, I believe, on Medium. I don't have a handy link for that one, so you'll have to find it yourself. Um, was to, we basically applied these principles to a game in development, or two games in development, in fact. Uh, we collaborated with two studios, Disruptor Beam and Gumbug, and we looked at the, some key performance indica indicators both before and after um, changes have been made based on the feedback that we provided in a report based around the principles. So this slide did have another picture on it, which unfortunately it doesn't anymore, uh, and I'm not sure where it's gone, but this graph uh, shows the before and after changes on the initial session length. So, Okay, uh, initial session length. So as you can see, after the research was done, after the changes were implemented, initial session length doubled. Um, and we also saw massive upswings in premium currency spend and general resource usage within the game. And yeah, and the Google one we have not quite finished yet, but it will be released very soon, and we can't wait to share that one with you as well. Thank you very much. Any questions? Two whole minutes for questions. Yeah. <laughs> no? no? Okay. No. Okay. Thank you very much.
Uh, okay, so um, uh, the research that I'm presenting here today is based on a bunch of papers, mostly published at PI. If you want more details, come find me after. I also posted the, the links in there. So, um, so in this talk, I will argue that as play, uh, game user researchers, um, we should all integrate uh, player attribution into our research tool blocks when we think about uh, designing um, success and failure in games. And I want to start with two quotes of players describing difficult games. So um, one is, obviously I died a lot, but every time I learned something new, it took me a total of six hours attempting to beat the boss. Once I beat it, there has been no better feeling of satisfaction. This is someone talking about Dark Souls. And here's another player talking about a different game. Totally frustrated with this game, to the point where my wife is yelling at me to stop playing. All I do is keep dying. Does anyone think this is fun? This game is really unfair, not a good experience for me. Uh, different game, not Dark Souls. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not going to say what. There was a link down there. Anyway, um, both of these people uh, played very difficult games that challenged them, but difficulty doesn't always elicit the same response. So some, some games elicit grit and are ultimately rewarding, while others feel frustrating and punishing. And as game user researchers, um, it is important for us to know when is difficulty rewarding and when is it just frustrating? And uh, to answer this question, we have to look beyond just counting deaths and we have to look at how people actually experience failure. And uh, psychology has actually offered very helpful frameworks to explain how people react to achievements. Uh, the most prominent one being attribution theory. And attribution theory proposes that uh, we assign causes to events in our lives. So when we succeed or fail, we tell ourselves sto we tell ourselves stories as to why this happened to us, and these stories we tell ourselves, these narratives we create, have an impact on how we respond to these failures and successes. And attribution theory identifies four dimensions which we can uh, by which we can describe how someone attributes uh, events in games. So uh, internality describes whether the cause for an event lies within me or outside of me. So maybe I lost because I didn't try hard enough, or maybe I lost because my teammates were all incompetent. Um, so that's a dimension of internality and exter uh, internal and external. Um, the second dimension is stability. So some causes are stable, while others are unstable over time. Uh, controllability describes the extent to which I can volitionally alter a cause. So maybe I lost because of lag, which is what happens to me all the time when I play. Uh, even, even in board games, even in board games. Um, or I lost because I wasn't careful enough, and this is something that I can control in the future. Uh, and the last dimension is globality. So some causes may be specific to one instance in a game, while others may affect my performance in all games, even or even in other areas of my life. Um, and these dimensions have been shown to be valuable in understanding how people react to achievements. So feel, uh, feelings of pride and competence after success are predicated by an internal attribution. Um, de defeatist attitude after failure is predicated on the belief that whatever caused the defeat is stable over time. Tenacity, the resistance to endure failure and, uh, un until a challenge is overcome, requires the, pre uh, the player to believe that they have control over whatever caused their defeat. Attribution theory, oh, oh wow, that looks horrible. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry, I hope it oh Jesus. Uh, that originally looked different, uh, I promise. Um, so the, the core information is there though. So attribution theory can help us understand how players experience success and failures in games. The problem is, ooh, no. Uh, so the pro just listen to me, don't look, don't look. Uh, the problem is we currently have no means to measure uh, how players attribute uh, success and failures in games. So we can assume that, players, uh, that player attribution is predictive of player experience, but we have no means to investigate these relationships. And uh, to address this problem, yeah, this, this looks better, all right, cool. Uh, so to address this problem, we created the game-specific attribution questionnaire. Uh, the tool measures how players attribute their performance in a game session. And the uh, game-specific attribution error is a reliable and valid tool consisting of 13 items rated on a seven-point Likert scale. And it, I'll give you the citation at the end so you can just look at the paper and it's all there. Um, so let's get back to uh, difficulty in games. Uh, the, quote, the quote from the beginning, uh, but every time I learn something new, is indicative of an internal and controllable attribution of failure. So we started looking at how attribution is linked to perception of difficulty. 
Uh, a recent study in our lab distinguishes in-game and at-game frustration. And uh, uh, the results indicate that at-game frustration is associated with an external attribution of failure, uh, whereas in-game frustration is associated with an internal attribution of failure. So attributional frameworks uh, can help us distinguish uh, positive and negative experiences of failure. Uh, dynamic difficulty adjustment is another good example of how we can leverage our knowledge from attribution theory to understand player experience. So there's a large body of research looking at dynamic difficulty adjustment that uses assistance techniques. And uh, the uh, assumption has always been that when you help someone with the system by rubber banding or making them making the bullets curve towards the enemy and they know about it, they're going to uh, attribute it externally and it's going to spoil the fun. However, um, a recent study of ours showed that players are actually really willing to attribute success to themselves even if you tell them that it was the system doing it. Uh, and this is uh, very coherent with what in psychology is called self-serving attribution biases. Uh, I'm sorry, this, I don't know why this didn't work, so yeah. <laughs> uh, these are just two examples where player attribution can help us understand player experience. And uh, using the game-specific attribution questionnaire, we now have a tool to investigate how player attribution affects player experience. So again, this is the citation for the paper. Uh, also, if you have questions, come find me after the talk. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions, should there be any. Yes, please. Sorry, it, it was Battlefront, right? Like, the it may or may not have been Battlefront. It's a multiplayer game. One of them is a single player game. One of them is known to be really, really, really hard. Right. Just from the start. There's no tutorial. You get pushed into it. If you play the game until the first boss, you mm. already kind of know that this is the kind of game that you're playing. Mm. So if you even get to the boss, you're the kind of person that got that boss. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Whereas with Battlefront, you're probably roped in by some dude that you know is a little bit <laughs> Playing Overwatch, let's play some other. Mm -hmm. You go on, you play this other game, it's a multiplayer game, there are other people in there. You're probably a very different type of player, expecting a very different type of player experience. Mm -hmm. um, how does the questionnaire, um, how does your scale um, look like when you compare different games? Is, is mm -hmm. that even possible to compare different games, or is it very like player game preference? Mm -hmm. I think that's a that's a really good question. I think uh, the, the the strength that comes from from these psychological frameworks is that they're uh, especially in attribution is these dimensions are independent of specific mechanics, right? So uh, uh, externality versus internality is really just asking does the cause for for my success or failure lie within me or outside of me? So in this example, let's say for argument's sake, it was Battlefront. Um, uh, in this example, this player was. Uh, was <laughs> this player was, was deeply disturbed because uh, um, they kept going into uh, multiplayer modes and were matched against people that were way stronger than them. Uh, and if that person were to fill out our questionnaire, they would rate very low in internality. Right? So they would attribute their failure externally and uncontrollably because they did not have uh, the, the, um, the perception that they can affect uh, the people that they play against. Now, if the person who played Dark Souls would, play, would fill out our questionnaire, right? They would uh, they would have the experience that every time they fight this boss, they learn a little bit more of how the AI works, right? They get a little bit better at dodging the attacks. So this is a highly internal and controllable attribution pattern. So I think, and these changes, even though they're different games, would manifest in our questionnaire. So that, that's the idea, and we valid we run many studies on this and we validated this. So uh, if you're interested in this, read the paper. Uh, Scale validation is a dark magic that is both beautiful and horrible. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I don't know the process works. All right, okay. I mean, <laughs> but um, so maybe the quotes were just a little bit like, Oh, yeah, the quotes well, were just to gain engaged. engaged. This is all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, I think there's one, one more question there, and then, uh, yeah. Uh, Hi, uh, thanks. That was a really interesting presentation. Uh, I feel like I missed something, so I'm hoping you can just explain a little bit more about this. But, uh, I mean, we all work in the field broadly, I think, of usability and user experience. Uh, so isn't it the case uh, that games are in fact made up of many different pieces, mm -hmm. and some of those pieces have what we would consider a difficulty, for example, a boss battle, but other parts do not, right? like opening a menu should effectively 
we have a difficulty level of zero, I guess. So in order to um, oh, thanks, so we're all, we're all, we're all on our jobs, I guess. Um, so is it wouldn't it be necessary at first I guess doesn't this assume that if they are essentially frictionless, frictionless experiences from a usability perspective? Because isn't it necessary first to validate that it's not that they don't understand, it's not that they can't it, and it's true that they cannot execute the task that's required of them that has a difficulty. I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Sorry, could you rephrase that? In order to uh, validate the experience, don't you need to first validate the usability of the game? Okay. To ensure that you're actually testing mm -hmm. the experience of the player and mm -hmm. not their lack of understanding. Of right. So I think this is, uh, obviously this is a, um, a motivational psychology approach to this. <laughs> And, uh, and I think you're right, it, it does build on a baseline understanding of how to operate the game. Although if, if this was a severe problem, I think what we would find in, in, in what, let's say someone just doesn't really understand where to click and has absolutely no idea how the UI of the game works, that would manifest itself in this tool as also something that is uncontrollable, stable, and external. So, uh, um, but I think this is why uh, and I think we all know this, I'm preaching to the choir, you don't ever just use one tool, right? You don't have, I'm not recommending to, this is the only tool you, you should use to evaluate your game, but this could be part of the toolbox that if you have a specific question about how people experience either successes or failures, this is something that you can use for this specific problem if, you, if, you, if you're suspecting that this is a UX uh, um, usability problem, uh, I wouldn't recommend this tool. I think it's a, know your problems and know the tools that you have at your disposal. Okay. Um, thanks, that's very clear. I guess, uh, and not to push it further, but we all have jobs because it's rarely the case that there's these are frictionless experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> <that's laughs> <that's laughs> cool. To solve those problems, yeah. so I just wanted to make sure I wasn't misunderstanding. Oh, no, no, no. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I think, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the time's up, but uh, come find me after and I'm happy oh. to talk to you. Or do we have time for one more? No, okay, sorry. It's not me. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. something completely different, but also with some of the same words in it. Uh, <laughs> uh, hi, I'm John Rieger. I'm a user researcher and user experience designer, and I focus on interactive physical experiences. I primarily work on interactives for brick and mortar retail stores, but also do a lot of work in the board game space, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so board game playtesting is a very different animal from video game playtesting, even though they both use the same words. Uh, the prep, it has a lot less formalism. Uh, there's not as much money to go around. It's a much smaller industry. But there's a huge culture of playtesting within the board game industry. And so, as such, I don't have to do as much advocacy or outreach or espousing the value of doing research. It's already there when publishers hire me on to run their playtesting programs. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, the methods that we use in board game playtesting uh, how some of those play out, especially when you talk about testing multiplayer experiences that are, are very social in nature, and then some of the kind of con common cognitive traps you can, you can see players fall into when you get these multiplayer social experiences. So board game playtesting is run under two primary protocols. The first we're going to call blind playtesting. This is you're testing a complete product experience. They're opening the box, they are going to read your rules, learn the game from the rules, and play a game uh, with very little interaction from the facilitator or moderator. Sometimes you might run this as a remote study as well, remote blind testing, where you are shipping these copies to players. You might be video having them video record, or you might be having them self-report. Uh, and that's, that is one of the primary protocols that we use in board game play testing. The other we'll call instructional testing. This is heavily influenced by the moderator or facilitator of the study because you are teaching the game. And you then may be, depending on how your study protocol is written, answering questions about play or trying to refer them back to reference material or the rule book. And that's where the vast majority of board game play testing happens. 
Because board games are so cheap, both from a material assembly cost and from a labor cost to assemble prototypes, you can use instructional playtesting extremely, extremely early. And I often liken it to participatory design, which is a product design practice that originated in Scandinavia. And this is where you're bringing in your end users and your customers into your design process. They become active stakeholders and active participants. So a lot of the protocols that I will run uh, as part of playtesting programs might be similar to things that you would run with stakeholders in business, in development, with your publishers. Uh, having them playtesters draw crude concept art, having playtesters conduct visioning and brainstorming exercises. Because the cost of iteration is so low, it's really common for games to change extremely radically, refocus mechanics and refocus audiences, because you can test early enough to steer the entire vision of the product. So moderating groups for board game playtesting has its own whole set of social dynamics. Uh, you have instituted a social layer on top of your game, so those of you who already are working on multiplayer games or local arcade games, online multiplayer games, the more social you get, the more you introduce all the weirdnesses that come with humans interacting with each other. Uh, and it's your responsibility as the moderator and the facilitator of these tests to be observing the social dynamics of the table and making sure that you're accounting for them in your data collection and in things like group discussions or interviews. So you can look at this table, for example, uh, of my, my blurry mid-play test picture. Uh, these four gentlemen laughing, they're leaned into the table, uh, pretty engaged in the game, and then there's one guy right in the center in the back on a spoke. <laughs> and it's your responsibility to figure out why players have checked out of your game. Because if you just stop the playtest here and ran a group discussion, I can pretty much guarantee you that this gentleman in the back would not be participating actively in discussion. And similarly, you'll see weird social dynamics crop up, uh, unfortunately all too commonly, where you have male playtesters talking over female playtesters, you have outside power imbalances that come into the table, and you are responsible for making sure every voice gets heard. That said, it's very, very important not to turn your playtest discussions into an interview. I always talk about kind of the contextual nature of post-game discussions. It's very natural activity for players after a game has finished to have a discussion with each other about it. And so you want to be there to refocus and guide that conversation to get actionable data out of it and combine that with your observational data from during the test. And you don't want to be rapid fire drilling them with interview questions. Uh, you can do that in, in things like individual questionnaires or surveys, or if you want to separate participants out. You don't want to turn that group discussion out of that kind of circ that magic circle of play where they're just talking about it with each other and they almost forget that you as a researcher are there. And with those weird social things come some strengthenings of cognitive biases that already exist. So these are uh, kind of well-proven psychological phenomena about how humans make decisions. Uh, the first one I want to talk about for multiplayer games is anchoring. It's an effect uh, about uh, perceived value, right? So if I pull up my phone and I say, how much is this phone worth? First person shouts out $100. Uh, now everyone else's perceived value of this phone is going to be anchored by the fact that the first valuation was $100. And you see this a lot when we talk about bias in survey questions uh, because someone you know, might uh, give a response in an interview or discussion, but it's important because attribution is fundamentally rooted in social conformity. So when you have physically co-located testing participants, you're gonna see much, uh, sorry, anchoring is very rooted in social conformity. You're gonna see a much stronger anchoring effect. And you actually see anchoring effects in mechanics as well and in the strategy and observation during play so uh, players will perceive one action or one strategy as more valuable, and you'll establish a, a weird kind of meta game or group think around an anchoring effect rather than any imbalance in your game. Uh, the second common kind of bias I wanted to touch on is attribution, which is great because we just had a little micro presentation about it. Uh, particularly touched on self-serving biases. Uh, so there's an attribution error that we like to call a fundamental attribution error, and this is about uh, that internal and external locus of control, the idea that if I lose at a strategy game, it's the game's fault because the randomness and the, the dice hurt my chances. If you lose at a game, you played poorly. And you always have to watch 
for when players are making attribution errors about their own and other performance, other players' performance in the game, especially as it relates to uh, their post-game surveys and questionnaires. So you want to always be combining that self-reported data with observational data. Uh, and then something I often talk to, uh, especially junior researchers and designers who don't have formal research training who are running playtests, is a deep attribution error on the part of the researcher. And this is over attributing data to your game experience and kind of inserting what I like to call poison data into your, your play test. Because if you think that everything that happens at your table is the result of your game, you're going to be very surprised because it turns out that human beings aren't perfect and sometimes they just have a terrible time for no reason. And you have to have some kind of rigidity and you have to be willing to kind of set aside that not everything that happens at your research session is responsible, is directly caused by your game. Uh, lastly, I wanted to very quickly close on uh, the value of some of these super early research techniques. It's not just about uh, streamlining your game. It's not just about finding those accessibility, uh, those uh, you know, little usability errors, but because in board game play testing we can test extremely early, it's about finding the core engagement and fun of your game. So late last year I was working on a game called Toil and Trouble. It's a game where you're witches and you brew potions. And where we thought the fun of the game was, was really tactical card play where you're putting out ingredients on these recipes. Where the fun actually was, was the moment where players dumped all of those ingredients into a little plastic cauldron and shook them up. <laughs> uh, and it turns out that tactile sensation was the most important part of the game. And so we actually redesigned the whole flow of the game to deliver that experience as many times as possible. And that's the kind of thing you can only do when you can prototype early and, and iterate really rapidly. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, if you if all have any questions about board game playtesting, please come find me, and I'm sure we have time for a very quick question. One question. <laughs> thank you. Any questions we have? Nope. <laughs> Just standing. How do you control for... Can you give us an example of how you one time you got feedback and suspected anchoring might have been occurring and then how you like controlled for that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, recently I've been hired on as the developer to run a, uh, developer is a different role in board game industry than it is in video game industry, that's the side. Uh, I've been hired on to run the playtest program for a fairly in-depth strategy game. And the core of this game is at the beginning of each round, you perform an auction for which actions you're going to be taking that round. And the highest bidder on each of seven actions gets to do that action the most powerfully. So it's a great example of assigning value to a specific action. And what we often see is that whichever action performs the best in round one, the game is always played over four rounds, then tends to be overbid for the remaining three rounds, uh, despite whether that is truly the best action for players to be taking. Because someone performed well with it, and, and you know, regardless of what value was necessarily assigned, uh, someone, someone did well in round one, we say, hmm, that's the best action, and now we get to assign a value to it in rounds two through four, and that value tends to be overinflated. Uh, so, yeah. All right, cool. Uh, find me if you have more questions. We're, I know we're very pressed for time, so. gears a tiny little bit. Um, it's going to be quite different because I think I'm also pretty much the only person of the experimental research showcase who took experimental literal. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about um, an experiment I uh, ran for uh, my dissertation and I'm going to try and fit it into eight minutes, which is going to be really rough. Um, just really quick about me. Um, my name is Lina Oskowait and um, I got my PhD at USC writing about um, Twitch female streamers and um, video game live streaming and the perception of female gamers. So basically, 
I used to play a lot of World of Warcraft on a rather high level. <laughs> so I had a lot of people asking me, hey, I mean, you could just, you know, play some, some video games online and everyone would watch you because basically all you need to have is a low-cut shirt and you'll be good to go. You're just going to earn money. It's going to be awesome. Um, I was like, really? I'm not so sure about this one, but okay. We'll see. Um, I was also getting more and more interested in Twitch as a communication media scholar um, about how we can see Twitch as a new medium, um, whether we can apply some theory we know from, from old media, like TV, ancient stuff, and apply it onto Twitch. Um, and so I began to get more and more curious about whether all of these negative stereotypes about female streamers might actually have an impact on how viewers of these channels perceive female gamers in general. Um, I also noticed that there was a lot um, of overlap between the consequences that we know of sexual objectification. So if both men and women, no matter whether they like men or women do this, by the way, sadly enough, um, we all objectify women to some degree, and um, a few of those consequences really um, um, entail perceiving them as less capable, perceiving them as less intelligent, less moral, less friendly, which matches up pretty well with what we know are the common stereotypes about female gamers, right? Like, they're just not good enough. And that's what we basically also think about female streamers. So I had this great idea, which uh, was pretty rough, of designing an actual field experiment using Twitch streams that already existed. Because you can't really go and study something like Twitch in a vacuum, right? You can't just make up a fake streamer and be like, hey, you should watch this now and have the same impression. Because there is so much interaction involved. There's like donation alerts, um, subscriber alerts, um, interaction between the streamer, the viewers, the viewers themselves, and so on. Um, so I asked research questions about which types of streamers are more um, likely to be objectified and what that leads to. And I found these women, um, Carolina Janet, and um, those were my two experimental conditions. Um, a streamer that would be more likely to be objectified, one that would be more likely to be uh, personalized and a control, which was the NALCS uh, tournament stream. And I ended up recruiting people via Twitter, Reddit, and so on, which was a horrible thing too, because my god, people are mean. It's really hard to convince them to watch a stream for a few hours for four weeks if you can pay them $20, because <laughs> dissertation budgets are rough. Moving from academia to industry, I get that very often that people are like, you will need to work really quick and limited resources and something. It's like, yeah, you tried being your one man <laughs> company and having a $2,000 budget to run a dissertation on, but yeah, we'll see. Um, so I ended up recruiting these people and assigned them randomly after a, a survey to uh, conditions, had them watch their respective Twitch channel for four weeks, and later on surveyed them again. Um, what I found was that um, people seek out certain streamers for a very specific reason. For female streamers, it's pretty indicative that either you go and want to watch a pretty girl play a video game, then you really don't care what kind of game that is, whether she's good at it, or whatever she does. You just want to see a pretty girl play a video game, or you want to see an interesting personality entertain you, or an expert gamer. But there is not a lot of overlap between this. Um, also, what was very interesting was that the streamer in the objectified condition was actually the better player. She's a Diamond 2 League player. So if you know something about League, that will tell you she's like in the top somewhat 2% of the player population. So she's really good at that game. However, the people rated her on a 10 scale of something like around a 6. Whereas the other girl, who's slightly worse at the game, was rated at like 7.5. Because, you know, one of them was just perceived to be less capable. Um, I also did some pre-test, post-test comparisons where I um, learned that after this, there were some learning effects. Um, people were more likely to um, think that 
female Twitch streamers should be more attractive. However, what I thought was the most important finding was that yes, representation on Twitch matters. So when I asked the people that were assigned to watch one of the female streamers, how many players they think of the general League of Legends population are female, they responded something around 30, which is a crazy number, right? Like I think, I don't know if you know, but I think it's more like 5%, maybe, maybe seven or something, if you want to be friendly, but likely not 30. Um, and when I asked the people who were assigned to view the control, they responded, oh, maybe something like 14. The guys went with 27 in the sample, probably because they were like, ooh, there's this girl asking me questions. I should better not be too mean. So there might be some bias in here. Um, but in the essence of it, it was very important, apparently, to see a woman play the game. So um, what we can take away from this is doing research in the field is rough. If you ever want to test your game and figure out, is my game fun to play? Yay. Is my game fun to stream? Who knows? Is my game fun to watch on a stream? Because maybe that becomes more and more important if you look at, I guess, Fortnite right now or something, right? And how much buzz you can create by just being out there and being watched. Maybe you will at some point be in a situation where you will need to partner up with a streamer and figure out if your game is fun to stream and watch. And um, then the important takeaway here is that you should really make your choice wisely and look at the community in detail that they have messed around their stream because otherwise there might be some problems, something like, you know, well, if that chick can play the game, then it's way too easy for me. I'm not even trying that out, for example. And also, if you want to reach new market segments, I mean, we all know that there are not that many women playing games, but there are many women who have the money to buy lots of games. And maybe one of the entrance barriers that they think that's not for me. So if you can, for example, find someone, partner up with them, have them play their game, stream their game, might be an important and interesting thing to see where this will lead us. All right, representation on Twitch matters. <laughs> I do not have a question slide. Yes. I was just curious, uh, you can go. I'm so sorry. Please. Oh, no, ask. No, you do it. Okay. <laughs> um, I just want to say, like, this is a really unique experience because I actually participated in this research program. <laughs> so, you know, I get to see the results today. Um, how did you choose which of the female streamers um, that you chose for your survey? How did you pick those two people? Yeah, I had very limited time, so I didn't really talk about this. Um, there was um, a framework that I came up with from some previous research where I really did qualitative um, um, exploration of, of a ton of Twitch streams. And I compared stuff like camera image versus gaming screen, right? If the camera takes uh -huh. up almost half as much of the stream, then I would conclude that this person probably builds their community around themselves and maybe their body, maybe their personality, rather than the game that they play. So there were a few distinctions based on, you know, expert player versus variety streamer. Um, do they play a bunch of games on their stream? Are they just a pro player playing in their, in their spare time making some money? Um, and with those, I was mostly looking at also how they interact with their chat. Um, I found that for the, the streamers <laughs> that are so-called boob streamers, I'm sorry to say, um, but it's a thing, um, they are generally um, more interacting with chat directly, but there is no community around their channel as much. Did the two women in your study know that they were part of it? No. No, all right, thank you. And then, yeah, one stopped streaming halfway through, so. That was pretty rough. <laughs> so much for 